Psalm 84 verse Psalm 84 verse 1 How lovely is your dwelling place O Lord of hosts my soul longs yes faints for the courts of the Lord my heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars O Lord of hosts my king and my God blessed are those who dwell in your house ever singing your praise Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. At this time, Pastor Paul will come up and share with us God's word. good to be with you again and worshiping together. Norma Jean uh, appeared to have everything. It seems that when we look at some people around us or in the public eye or on Facebook, social media, that some people look like they have everything going for them, that they live their life, it seems, without any valleys or difficulties in their life. Norma Jean appeared to have everything. Famous men, even presidents, desired her. And she made millions of dollars, and she was always in the news. And yet, she died of, from an overdose. She choked to death on her own vomit, and it was ruled a suicide. Most of us know Norma Jean better by her stage name, Marilyn Monroe. She appeared to have everything going for her, but clearly she didn't. In Job chapter 14, verse 1, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. The psalm that we read this morning, Psalm 84, is a song of, of a journey, a pilgrimage. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, every Jewish male was required to make a pilgrimage to the temple, the tabernacle, three times a year, if at all possible. And so as they are going to Jerusalem, oftentimes that would be the highlight of the year for them. It was a magnificent city uh, that uh, they could go and see distant relatives. I recently went to Korean Southwest Presbytery representing our General Assembly. And um, I have some relatives in the Los Angeles area. Haven't seen them for 42 years or so. And so I got to see them. Uh, now that wasn't Jerusalem, but uh, for, for Asians, for Korean Americans, I suppose it's uh, the equivalent of Jerusalem in America for us, right? I'm, I'm going there and I'm thinking kalbi and all these things are going to be very tasty and uh, I, I didn't find anything super tasty so I, maybe I just went to the wrong places but anyway uh, but I, I got to see my relatives that it, some of whom I have not seen for 42 years uh, and so that was a, a blessing but for many of the Jewish people that's how it w kind of was to go to Jerusalem People traveled great distances, and obviously they didn't have the conveniences of modern travel, like Spirit Airlines, um, tight, cramped space. <laughs> Somehow on, there were three legs, because on the return trip I had a, a, a layover. On the trip two, trip going out, I had a direct flight. Uh, but somehow they upgraded me to row four, seat 4D, and apparently that's a comfy seat, so they gave free drinks too. So I was like, wow. I was thinking I was going to not drink for six hours of the flight plus the time before the flight, and 
you know, until I could get my bags and my rental car and all that stuff. But uh, turned out, praise God, I, I, I got to drink well on the way out. Uh, but on the way back, I had a 4D again on the, on the first leg to Las Vegas. And then from Las Vegas back to Newark Airport, they gave me seat 7E. And I was like, oh, this is a lot smaller <laughs> than 4D. It wasn't a comfy seat. My knees with my short body uh, had about three inches before it hit the seat in front of me. So for me, it was okay. But the two big guys next to me, seat E, D, E, F, right? So I'm in the middle seat, not, not the window or aisle. Uh, yeah, it, it was tight. Um, and, and the big guy to my right, he, he didn't lower the armrest, and I didn't ask him to because I, I felt like it might jab into his side, and that's probably why he didn't lower it. Uh, but um, people travel great distances uh, in, in the old way of traveling to Jerusalem back in the day without airplanes. And yet they endured great hardship in the process of doing that. And so they needed some encouragement. And so one of the ways that they encouraged one another was singing psalms like this. Uh, and so Psalm 84 uh, expresses this deep longing for God's presence. And their goal as they sing in this psalm is to dwell in God's house. It's kind of like a homecoming type of song. So as they traveled, many of them passed through this valley of Baca that is referred to in verse 6. Uh, it refers to a, a valley where there's uh, tears and weeping as they get to Jerusalem. So some scholars believe that it was a, a, a garbage dump. Others believe it's named after the balsam tree, which grew in dry places such as the Valley of Baca. It was a tough place for, for these pilgrims. At, at times, the tree would appear like it's weeping its sap, reminding people about their own difficulties and their own struggles as they go through these valleys. And many in our, in our lives, many valleys are before us as well. We live life on this earth, and if you're uh, like most people who have lived to at least your teenage years or preteen years, some of you I saw earlier were studying for your SSAT, I guess it was. And some of these words that are, for me now, pretty common words for you are like, how do you know these words? Well, they're, you, they'll become common to you one day. Uh, but for now, they're special words, and they seem difficult to learn. And as we live life, there are all these difficulties that we face and difficult challenges, different valleys that we face. And maybe it's academic for you, maybe it's relational, but we face these difficulties in our life on our way to the new Jerusalem, that new Jerusalem being Zion in heaven ultimately. And that's even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death from another psalm, right? We face these difficulties in life. We have these valleys in our life. But even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. Why? Because we look to the cross of Christ. And there's several truths that God gives us in our spiritual journey. Uh, the first one we see in verse 6, the first part of verse 6. As they go through the valley of Baca, it says, as they pass through this valley, we have to remember those words. They pass through, they go through this valley. In other words, they're not meant to stay in the valley. They're not setting up camp in the valley. They're not doing a... a some, some activity in the valley. They're not going to stay there, but they're passing through. One pastor was asked about his favorite part of the Bible, and his answer was, it came to pass. And so he was asked why, why it came to pass. Why not Psalm 23 or the golden rule or something like that? And he said, well, those are good too, but I like it came to pass. I know that whenever I go through uh, something difficult, no matter how bad it gets, that it too will come to pass and I'll make it through. In other words, when we face difficulties in our life, we're going to face these difficulties, but you know that just as things in the Bible 
happened, the difficulties that happened, even in Jesus' own life, that those things come to pass. All the things that happened to all the prophets of the Old Testament, all the disciples, all those difficulties that happened in their life, they come to pass. And God has a plan for you, and God has a plan for blessing your life, but that comes through all the valleys and difficulties that you face as well. And so you need to remember that. When we are living on this earth, we're not meant to live here and set up camp here permanently. That's how the world looks at the world, right? They look at this world and they say, well, let me earn as much money as I can. Let me establish as much uh, fame and reputation and power and influence and whatever I want, whatever all the world values. And after all of that, I'm going to try to stay here as long as I can with all those great toys I have. That's the way that the world thinks. But the Bible tells us, no, that's not how God designed us. When we go through the valley of Baca, when we go through our pilgrimage on this earth, that may be 70 years, maybe 100 years, maybe 120 years, however long it may be, that that's just temporary. It's a pilgrimage. You're passing through to get to the ultimate heavenly city. Our spiritual journey in, on this planet will face some difficulties, but we have to remember that it's not our final destination. And Satan tries to deceive us. He tries to tell us, you know what, that difficulty you're facing, it's because you're not worth it. It's because you didn't study enough, because you didn't do this thing right or that thing right, or you did something that you shouldn't have done. You went somewhere you shouldn't have gone. And it's not going to get any better. It's always going to be like this. And he tries to steal the hope that you have as a believer in Jesus Christ. Naomi, if you remember, after the death of her husband and sons, felt that way. Isn't that crazy? In a world where women had no influence or power or jobs in the typical sense we have in America today, that Naomi would lose her husband and her sons. I mean, how difficult a life do you think you have? Well, that was quite the difficult life she had. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, she says, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Now, you have to understand that the name Naomi means pleasant, delightful. But the name Mara means bitter. So she recognized how difficult her life was. And and she she wanted to reflect that in her name. In Job chapter 6, verse 8 through 11. I'm going to read that for us. Job chapter 6, verse 8 through 11. Oh, that I might have my request and that, the, and that God would fulfill my hope, that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. This would be my comfort. I would, not, I would ev- even exult in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should be patient? So Job faces his difficulties, and he sounds like he's given up. Satan tries to steal the hope that he should have in God, that you and I should have in Christ. For some people, they've set down roots here in the Valley of Baca, the chronic complainers, the people who wallow in self-pity. And if that's you, then we need to remember that that's not what God's intention for us is, to settle down here in the Valley of Baca. God's intention for the Valley of Baca for us is for us to pass through, that it should come to pass, because God has something better in mind for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we need to remember the promises of God which are fulfilled in Christ. The providence of God, the sacrificial 
lamb of God that God himself provided in the person of Jesus Christ. We need to remember the presence of God that at Christmas time as we celebrate Emmanuel God, God with us, that God came to be with his people. We need to remember the power of God that at Easter time, we remember the resurrection of Christ, that God has power over death and anything that this world can challenge us with. And so pilgrims pass through the valley. Pilgrims also find refreshment in the valley. In the second part of verse six there, we see, I'm going to read the first part again. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. And so, in other words, they dig wells. Have you ever seen those survivor shows? I don't mean like survivor on CBS where they're in a controlled setting and, and uh, they, they fight each other. It's a democracy, right? They, they, they say who they like or don't like and they vote people off and that, not, not that kind. But the survivor show where they're supposedly in the wilderness somewhere, naked and afraid, survivor man or um, those kind of shows, Bear Grylls, man, man versus Wild, those kind of shows. Right? When you look at those shows, I don't know how real they are, but they're about as close to real as I guess most of us will get in terms of living in the wilderness. And I remember that in some of those shows, they would say something like, well, if I go to the top of a hill, I can see the landscape and I can see where there's a patch of green. And it's going to be usually in a valley somewhere where the, the rain waters, even in the desert, are going to go down towards that one spot. And so I'm going to go head over there because that's where I need to get water. Because that's where the water is going to pool. And so they go there and they start digging a little bit. Uh, they don't have tools usually in those kind of shows. Uh, and so they dig with whatever they can, whatever tools they could find around them. And, and so when you look at that, they, they look for that lowest point, even in the dry land, and dig wells. The early Nebraska travelers, they found the soil to be rich and dark, but there was no water there. And so they called it the Great American Desert. And many people died because of the lack of water. Today, when we look at Nebraska, Nebraska is called the breadbasket of our nation. There's more wheat and corn uh, that is grown there than in most other states. The difference between the great American desert and the breadbasket of America is that the early travelers didn't see that there were underground aquifers that covered two thirds of the state. And someone figured this out and then they realized, well, we could dig that deep and we could fish that water out of there. And so they tapped into the underground aquifers and turned the great American desert into the breadbasket of America. You and I, if we are traveling through this valley of Baca that we call this planet and this earth, where we face difficulties in our life, we need to dig wells. And if we dig a spiritual well in our life, then we're going to be tapping into the wellspring of life, and that is Jesus Christ himself. We do that by tapping into God's word. We do that by, by turning to God's word every day and every week. And that's why we come to church. We come to church to hear God's word preached, to be refreshed in his grace and his, his glory. We come to God's word every day so that every day that we face this valley of Baca, that we're tapped into God's wellspring of life. We're told in the Bible that Jesus himself is the word of God. He's the wellspring of life. So we're tapping into Jesus Christ even in the valley of Baca. And by prayer, we ask God to open his word to us. And notice the, the grace of God there in verse 6. The second part of verse 6 there. Let me read it again for us. They make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. You know, that, that rain water that's coming down 
It's ultimately the water that replenishes even the underground. But God placed it there. It's ultimately there because God placed it there. And we need to remember that. The good things that you have in life are the, the, the common grace of God that God gives not only to his believers but to all of creation. And God has given us an oasis in Jesus Christ so that if you are in Christ, not only do you get this common grace, but you, you get God's word, God's wellspring of life. You get to tap into all of that. And you need to remember that while we travel this pilgrimage on this earth. So pilgrims pass through the valley. Pilgrims find refreshment in the valley. And pilgrims focus on what's better. So we need to look forward to God's presence in our life. In verses 1 through 4 there, we see this. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And then it gives this illustration of birds as they desire to be in God's presence as well. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. In verse 5, blessed are those who, whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. In, in the uh, NIV, it says there, blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. In other words, those who have, have their view towards living not on this earth ultimately, but passing through, finding refreshment while they're here, passing through, a rest stop, so to speak, an oasis, but ultimately with their goal towards heading to their heavenly home. I don't, I don't know how you're living in this earth. A lot of people who look to the troubles of this world, when you look at their life, it's so filled with distress. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of people who are very distressed in this life, who have stress written all over their face all the time, usually they're focused on the things of this world and not focused ultimately on the things of God. If we remember that we're here temporarily and we're just passing through, we're just visitors, how long is your pilgrimage on this earth so far? Your age, that's how long your pilgrimage is so far. But when you die, that's the length, the full length of your pilgrimage until you get to your eternal home in heaven. And if you remember that, then you're going to live a much more joyful life. Your Christian life on this earth is going to soar because you know that you're not living here on your own strength, but you're living here in the presence of God. Uh, let's go on. In verse 7, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And then look at verse 9. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. And when the Bible is speaking here of the anointed, God's anointed one, he's ultimately referring to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. In verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Remember that old song? Well, that's, this is where that comes from. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. In other words, it's better to be in God's presence for just a, a glimmer of his glory and his magnificence of who he is. To even be just a mere doorkeeper in God's dwelling place is a lot better to than to live among the wicked, to have all the comforts of this world. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords. Right? Another wonderful hymn of old. I'd rather have Jesus than riches or gold. Right? We, we look to the things of God and we say, well, if that if that is really that much more glorious than anything this world, you look at the things that rich people have and people that 
you can't imagine have, right? And you're like, man, they got it good. They got it easy. But it's all just one part of their life you're seeing. You're not seeing their valleys. You're not seeing their difficulties, their struggles. When you look at all of it together, unless they have Christ, ultimately all of it's meaningless. The people around them, if they have a lot of wealth, they want to protect that wealth, and so they keep everyone at arm's length. Do they have true friends like you might have true friends? A friend that is closer than a brother. That when you're stuck on the highway somewhere at 3 a.m., that you can say, I can call this brother or this sister, and they'll come and help me. Do you have a friend like that? Well, if you're in Christ and if you have brothers and sisters in Christ, then you can find a friend like that. And the psalmist here is saying that instead of all of those things that this world offers, being close to the wicked, being having all their toys and trinkets, that I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, or in the NIV, blameless. Right? And who is that one who walks uprightly? You and I, well, we try sometimes, but we fail. The one who ultimately walks uprightly, blamelessly, is Jesus Christ himself. In verse 12, the O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Again, you and I, we try to trust in God, but there's times that we are weak and we fail. The one who ultimately trusts in God is Jesus Christ himself, the one who is the true representative man, the true Adam that represents you and me if you are in Christ. So there's many troubles in this life. But you need to remember that you're just passing through this earth, the valley of Baca, and you need to find strength in Christ through these valleys because you find refreshment in Christ. And you need to look forward to that day that is in heaven that's going to be better. Let's pray.